Hopefully the food is, food is good, Lord willing. So we got to study. You ready to study? We have a lot of ground to cover and we don't have much time. We want to dig deep into the word of God. Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, the greatest thing that we need is Jesus. What is greater that we need than Jesus? What is greater than Jesus? Nothing uh, is greater than Jesus that we need in these last days. And so before we even get to the end, I'm telling you the end from the beginning. Amen. Do we have a little, lot of time left? It's Wednesday already. I can tell you we're still really on Monday night. You understand what I mean by that? Now you say, I thought we start on Tuesday. Yeah, we start on Tuesday, but we're really on Monday night. And by the grace of God, I want us to get as much as we can. But by God's grace, we have to pray and study. Lord, take away this tick-tock mind. You know, the studies have been done. Scientific studies have been done as to what happens to the brain under that type of environment. Just look it up. Just look up tick-tock mind. You'd be amazed at how much science has come out explaining what it's done. But you know, the Bible is the greatest book in the universe. And the Bible is not like any other book. I read in the book Education. My teacher taught me to read that book. And I read the book Education. And it says... That the creative energy that made the, the world, all of this is in the word of God. Waiting to be downloaded into these brains of yours and mine. And even if we have abused it and, uh, by uh, foolishness, you know, the Bible can restore it. I know I abused this mind with foolishness. But this word of God, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking what? He thereto according to the word of God. I'm so thankful that we serve a God that's creative. And that, you know, he doesn't need anything to create. You know, in science, they say that nothing can be made without pre-existing matter. Jesus can create something out of nothing. And if it were not so, there would be no hope for righteousness in my heart. Because there's nothing to start with. But because of Jesus, we have hope. What do you say? Now, we don't have much time. I think that we better uh, jump right into the uh, chase and see if we can get some understanding here. You remember that we were talking about some things that were developing. And we found out that. In uh, every in, in evidence in every field of knowledge, how many fields of knowledge? Now we we our goal to our goal this study is not really to go into the depth of how close we are, although we'll talk a little bit about it. But that's not really my focus right now. As we're going, last year we went through some detail, the detail, the detail, the detail. I mean, we could we could spend an entire week doing that. But I want to move a little further to understand some things. And so, but 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 in every field of knowledge, I don't care where field you go, you can go to any field. Politically, economically, socially, it doesn't matter which, which way you turn. Every field of knowledge tells us we're at the very end of time. If you were studying water, you would find that we're at the end of time. If you were studying rubber, you would find we're at the end of time. If you were studying sand, you would find, do you know that you can do a study on sand and prove we're in the final generation? Everything in the Bible, every field, everything is screaming out, crying out. The rocks are now crying out that we're going to have a crisis. And what is that year? Talk to me, somebody. Crisis what? I'm going to put this up in the corner so you don't forget it. I'm going to put it up in the corner. I'm trying to use my board wisely. <laughs> 2025. You don't want me to be in trouble, do you? 2025 plus or minus. What, what does plus mean? When, is it, when we say 2025 plus, what do we mean 2025 plus? What do we mean by that? It could be a little bit more. Minus means it could be a little less. Now, do you know that some people are afraid to teach and preach because they don't want to be like Jonah? You know, Jonah didn't understand the character of God. Do you know, brothers and sisters, I'm praying for a few more years. I remember in 2019, we were in New York somewhere talking about this message. Some of you may have been there. And we were talking about this, and we were talking about what was going to happen in 2020. And someone said, oh, you're date setting. I said, no, no, I'm talking about history and prophecy. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is reality. That we, and, and as I speak tonight, do you know that something worse is getting ready to be unleashed in COVID-19? I promise you. All of that lockdown, all of, all of the things we saw with the entire economy shut down, something coming worse, it's like a wave. You know, a tsunami wave, it comes in, but then it goes back. It comes in sharp. I remember talking to my wife, and my wife was saying, you, what do you think? Do you think it's going to back up? I said, oh, yes, it's going to back up because a tsunami is coming. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, now people are thinking it's going back to like the usual, but in a tsunami, you know what happens? The person looks and they see the, 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 the water receding, and they get excited, and they go deeper into it. You know, it's amazing. The lockdown shut up, and we'll go deeper into the city. Never even remembering what happened. Do you know, when I was in New York, I said, look, Lord, have mercy. Keep up. Keep this until I get out of here. Do you know, as we were driving in, there was a large gate at the entrance of the city in almost every borough in New York. And some of you in New York know what I'm talking about. There's a gate you can shut. I'm going to show you on the screen forever, hopefully. That, 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 there's flood gates that have been put into all of the boroughs in New York that you can just show. You. They said it would stop the water from coming in. But they said easily to it can close down the city overnight. And all it takes is 30 minutes. You know, the prophet says that there will come a time when we will wish to get out of the city, but we'll not be able to. Heavenly Father, bless these words as we've opened it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want this quotation to almost be in your dreams. Let's read it together. The present is a time of what? Overwhelming interest, not to some, not just the religious leaders, but how much? All living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority. What type of men? Thinking men and women of what? All classes. Have their attentions fixed upon the, what do we need to become intelligent about? Some of the what? Events. Taking place all about us. They are watching the strained, restless relations that exist among the nations. Is that going on right now? What's happening in Ukraine, and in North Korea, and in South Korea, and in China? You know, relationships that have been warm have become cold overnight. Why? Something's happened. Inspiration says that soon there will come a crisis that no human bomb can cure. It says, they observe the intensity that is taking possession of how much? Every earthly element. That's every field of knowledge. Everywhere we can see this. It says, and they recognize. Now, who is the they that recognizes this? Thinking men and what? They recognize. They recognize that what? They recognize that something great and decisive is. Now, when it says about to take place, now, now there's some, too much talking going on. Heavenly Father, wherever we are, you did not bring us here so that we can talk and be distracted. I beg of you, Lord, whether we're on the ground floor or in the balcony, that our minds would see that we are here for such a time as this. I am here not to preach. I'm here because you're trying to save me. And Lord, each of us are for this very reason. I plead, Lord, that you would help us to sense that the end of all things is at hand. And we need Jesus like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. This is serious business, brothers and sisters. This says that they recognize that something great and decisive is what? About to take place. That Not America. That's not what it says. But that the what? The what? The world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. So I should be able to look at every field of knowledge and look and see that the thinking men, the intelligent men, the one who studied, the expert. I'm not talking about some of us who haven't studied anything. You and I, we don't call ourselves experts on science and experts on history, but the experts. You know, inspiration says that we should decide from the weight of evidence. Noah built the ark by faith. Faith is not some uh, figment of our imagination. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The Evidence. There's evidence with faith. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we look at what's going on, our pioneers all taught what we talked about last night, that in 7,000 years, our, uh, uh, the history of redemption is going to be completed. And that takes us to about 2031. Now, you remember that last night? Remember that? Now, this says a day is a thousand years. Now, here is a man by the name of uh, J.N. Andrews. And Jay and Andrews wrote in the Review and Herald uh, here, August uh, 21st, 1883. He did a series. Sister White's alive at this time, reading the Review and Herald. And he did a series. In fact, when, 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 uh, when they sent Jay and Andrews uh, to Switzerland as the first Seventh Adventist missionary, Sister White said, when we send you Jay and Andrews, we send you our best. Jay and Andrews, it was reported. That if you said any verse in the Bible, he can tell you the one before or after it. He put the Bible to his mind. Now, my brother and sister, here this man is writing an article. 
this pioneer of God. And it says in his sixth, this is the sixth article on what it was called the, let's read that. Can you read that? What did that say? So he's preaching about the great week of time, talking about what we're talking about, the, how seven days and 7,000, he's going through. Now, you know, Andrews University was named after this man. I wonder what he would do if he were alive. Because what he preaches, the institution for the most part calls it heresy. It says, after seven of these weeks of years came the year of Jubilee, Leviticus 25. In this year, liberty was proclaimed throughout all the land to all its inhabitants, and every man returned to his own inheritance. This signifies, based on this Bible text, that after the great Sabbath, during which the earth will remain what? Uncultivated for how long? It's based on that concept of the land. For a thousand years, the great week of what? 7,000 years being finished, the curse will cease after having consumed the earth with all who are wicked. Then the earth will be created anew by the power of God, and all the just will return to their inheritance in the new earth, and never no sin nor sorrow where Eden lost will become Eden restored, and the history of redemption spans 7,000 years. And do you know this is one of the reasons we're called Seventh-day Adventists, to understand this entire message. From Genesis to Revelation, you know every pioneer used to teach this. Haskell, Uriah Smith, all the pioneers taught this. It's from the Bible. In fact, we used to even sing about it, but somehow these pages get ripped out of our hymnals somehow. Today, we don't even see hymnals in our churches. You see chorus, uh, uh, chorus, little chorus books. If the devil doesn't like, he can sit on a tack. Why, the, only the devil will inspire you to sing a song like that. The devil not sitting on no tack. If he did, it wouldn't hurt him. The devil is trying to trick us so that we are seeing things that don't make him uh, afraid at all. You know, when a person really gets in danger, they don't sing, if the devil doesn't like it, sit on attack. You know, they start singing songs from the hymns. You let the devil come against you. You know, I haven't seen no foolishness like that. I remember hearing the story about the Titanic. You hear the Titanic? Supposed to be this boat and all the wealthy were on this thing. Then you had all these people there, and that, but they had the greatest so-called jazz band of the world on that boat. But when they hit that iceberg and that Titanic started going down, they didn't want the rap music anymore. They weren't playing Jay-Z at that time. They, could, they didn't care about Beyonce. They, they, they were not playing the rock and roll and the foolishness that we had today. At that time, you know that they requested a song. As they were sinking in the water, they requested a song. You know what song they said? They didn't sing all this other foolishness we sing. Not had to do nothing like that. No substance to that. You know what they said? Mirror my God to thee. But it's a shame that we wait until the last moments of our life to want to get near to Jesus. He's sweet, brothers and sisters. Why do we have to wait to the end to get close to Jesus? Now, brothers and sisters, this is what we're told. We believe that. Listen to the song. Here's Jehovah's Day. Remember Jehovah's Day, Jehovah's Rest? First of all, the chosen seven. Now, look, I'm, look, 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 look how it says that. I want you to see this. It says, Holy day, Jehovah's rest, of creation's week the best. Last of all, the chosen seven, blessed of God, to man was given. But I want to take you to a special one. I want to blow it up so you and I can read it together. What does it say? It says, all, this is stanza, verse 4, stanza 4, it says, all who speak the truth must say, it was. Now, you, you, didn't, you didn't remember that. You, you thought it was man. The original, they said, the Pope. I mean, they were straight. The day you're looking like, did they say that? They said, they said it was the Pope who changed the day. In God's what? In God's word. No change appeared. Talk to me now. Through the whole 6,000 years. They believed it. They sung it. This is Adventism. Seven-day Adventism. But our identity has been stolen from us. When a man has been totally enslaved, he is made to hate himself. You know, when you're in soft slavery, you still like yourself a little bit. But when you get totally enslaved, you learn to love your slave master more than you love yourself. And your distinctive identity, you don't want it anymore. You change your name and your culture. You change your heritage and your background. You don't like the distinctiveness of your features. And in every form of slavery, remember Daniel, when he got to Babylonian slavery, they changed his name. They took away his religion. They tried to take away his religion in his culture. But Daniel said, I'm going to remain faithful. God wants you and I to remain faithful. 
And then in this modern slavery, and the prophet told us that the slavery that took place in the United States of America was the worst form of slavery that ever existed on planet Earth. She says this is the reason why God allowed the Civil War to destroy so much in America because of the evil institution of slavery in America. Read it in volume one of the testimonies. Chapter after chapter talking about it. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you understand that in that slavery that took place in America, it was designed to ingrain, to make the slave hate him own self, to make, make him hate the color of his skin, to make him hate the shape of his nose and the shape of his lips, to make him hate the distinctive identity so that he hated himself. Then he didn't want to look like himself. And let me tell you something. If Seventh-day Adventists have been totally enslaved, you can tell because it will make us hate everything about Seventh-day Adventism ourselves. So that we hate Seventh-day Adventist diet. We hate Seventh-day Adventist dress. We, any, just the name just look like Seventh-day Adventist. We hate it. We have a whole generation of adults and young people that want to get away from Seventh-day Adventism because we have been enslaved. And the goal is not to condemn the young person. You can't fault the young man or the young woman in this hour for the position we're in. It's because we as adults have not shown them who we really are. When a young man, a young woman understands what it means to be a seven day Adventist, he doesn't walk with his head down trying to hide who he is. He recognizes that he represents the highest being in the universe, God himself, that we are ambassadors for Jesus. Now, my brothers and sisters, God is going to have an army of you ready to finish this work. I want to be a part of that. What do you say? He's going to have an army of adults, families that are not ashamed for Jesus. And it's amazing what we will do for the devil but what we will not do for Jesus. You know, for the devil, a young man will come in the church and talk for the devil. The devil will tell him, because you know it's not God telling you to talk. You know, sometimes a person gets in the church and they go out and pick up their cell phone and they take it out. But you know, God's not calling you while you're in the church. God's trying to talk to us, not call us out. My brothers and sisters, it's amazing that the, 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 the devil sometimes tempts us to do things that he himself will not do. You know, the devil would not talk in the presence of God unless he was got, got permission. The devil said, yo, go talk. The devil backs up. The devil fears and trembles, and you and I are with your audacity. And come into a meeting like this and just talk all the time. And bear the minister. And the minister, oh, he's a rough minister if he talks like that. My brothers and sisters, you better understand something. What's getting ready to happen in this world, you will wish that it got even straighter. We're told that before the coming of the Lord, that God's true messengers must preach a message more straight than that of John the Baptist. John the Baptist lost his head for talking so plain. John didn't have a lot of friends. But John wasn't looking for friends on this earth. John was looking to be the friend of God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When you're the friend of God, when a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies will be at peace with him. They won't even want to come close. There will be a holy dread to say, I don't know if I can talk to the man of God, the sister of God, the woman of God. That way they will watch. You know, before Jesus, they wanted to touch Jesus. But, you know, they wouldn't even touch Jesus because they recognized that the presence of God was with him. You know that God is going to protect us. He's going to put a light around us, we're told in the last days, that even when the weapons of war come against us, they will drop like straw to the ground. You know, we don't have to be afraid of anything if we have Jesus. I want Jesus. What do you say? And that's not what we we're talking about, but let's, let's go a little further. We saw the thing. Look what it says. Why the fall of the American Empire will come by what? And the prophet told us that thinking men will think this now. Now, what did we say was about 6,000 years? Now, do you recognize that the historian is coming close to the history of redemption? It says, the historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much what? Now, I want you to understand, this man didn't just come out of his bed and write this. This is written in what year? What year is this written? And I shared this with us in 2017. I shared this with us before. But look what it says. He says that, that all the things that are playing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what? Now, how did this man know that in 2020, things were going to go out the fan? What is he studying? Talk to me, somebody. What's he studying? History. It says... And growing rapidly by 2020 and would reach a critical mass no later than what? Now, what's he doing to determine this? He's looking at what? Talk to me, somebody. History. Every field of knowledge gives us weights of evidence, undeniable evidence. How America will collapse by 
2025. Look what year this is. You see what that year is? 2010. Now, what do we say? 2025. Talk to me, somebody. Talk to me, somebody. You know what 2031 is or 2030 is? Plus or minus. That's all. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says that the average empire survives for how long? 250 years is America at death's door. So it says the average empire, when you study history, for the last 3,000 years, over 100 histories of empires that existed on this earth, no matter what their position, the, the average lifespan of an empire, 250 years. Look what they said. It's very interesting. Cal Thompson, America's expiration date, will U.S. collapse in what? So I said, oh, that's something different. No, that's just 2025 what? That's just 2025 what? Plus. But all about the same time. That the thinking men know that we're on the verge that is about to take place. And these are what the thinking men are saying. Now, interestingly enough, here's Time P Research, a research uh, a, a journal. They're talking about something. They said, regardless of financial strength, political power and knowledge of previous history life cycles, no empire leader has ever been able to prevent its supremacy from what? In other words, no matter what empire it was, it always came down. Babylon was a great empire. So I said, how can you call it great? Well, the Bible says Babylon, but that, that great empire, that, that came down. Even though it was the golden kingdom, it came down. Am I right? And it came down by an inferior empire. Now, notice what it says. All of them came down. They come crashing down. In 1977, Sir John Glove, he was a writer. He was a, 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 a political leader. He was a, one that was in government, in the military. Very old man, wrote several books. He wrote an essay that was entitled The Fate of Empires. And he said that during three millennia, the average superpower duration period has been consistently of about, what's that word? Of about 20, 250 years. In other words, plus or minus. It says the full 250 year cycle corresponds to about 10, 25 year run. It says, especially if we consider that all the major changes during the 3,000 years in transportation. Speed, weapons, from local to global, it says no matter where they were, it always averaged 250 years. Now I want to ask you a question. Since you told me, well, you didn't tell me, but since you celebrated the 4th of July, <laughs> when, did it, when did America, when did your country declare its independence? When? Now, if we were to add 250 years to that, tell me, you, you remember math, did they tell me you're good in math, so I'm going to test you. 6 plus 0, 7 plus 5. I didn't hear you? 12, what do I do with the 1? I carry it over. Oh, it sounds good. All right, 7 plus 2, and then I add what? So I get a 0, and then I add that to what? I carry the 1, and 1 plus 1 is? So then the Irish last span of all empires has just gone down has been 250 years. Look at nation after nation after nation. Now, my brother and sister, that would mean that if history is right, that we should see America on the verge of collapse historically by 2026. Now, do you know that the Sunday law is passed to try to bring America back up? It's to restore temporal prosperity. Great controversy, 587, 588, 589. Now, if it is true that we're reaching the time of the collapse of America, we should begin seeing cracks in this country. Am I right? Even if you didn't have a date, even if you didn't know the date, if something was getting ready to collapse because of stress, what would you see in the building? What would you see in the building? Talk to me, somebody. You would see cracks in the structure. And as you saw the cracks, even if you didn't know a time, you would know what was about to happen just by seeing the cracks. So if we're really coming to the collapse of America, it's political system, it's economic system, it's social system, it's religious system. We should see cracks. Am I right? I'm going to show you one crack. One crack. That building is getting ready to come down. What you say? A little past that building can't last too long. Am I right? Here's 2023. This is the United States and the rest of the world. Someone says, well, I'm glad I'm not America. Let me tell you something. It's coming to a country near you, wherever you are. This is why it's called, now listen to me, why in the world is the idea of someone being 
what is called LGBT, and then they have Q, and sometimes they're like XZ, whatever. But LGBT, this movement, and while God has many in that movement that he loves, they don't understand how God made us. And so God wants to teach us this. But why would they call something that's celebrating this, why would they call it what? Why would they call it what? Isn't that interesting? What, what would make the name Shoes Pride? That's an interesting name. Now, something happened this year that should be very scary for every believer who understands the Bible and the prophecies. Something happened. Do you know what happened? With this, do you know what happened? And here you go. Where is that? Oh, but that doesn't, that don't mean anything. Just the flag just flying up there at the White House. No flag mean nothing. Notice where the flag is. I wonder why the middle. I wonder why not the outside. And do you remember on the cross of Calvary, there were three crosses. Remember that? Where was Jesus put in the cross of Calvary? Left or right or the middle? No reason? Just put in the middle? No reason? Was there a reason for it being put in the middle? Do you know that it was a part of that culture of Rome and preceding cultures? That that which is the most superlative, the, the extreme, the worst, is placed in the middle. And so the, all the best, the superlative, good or bad. And so when they put Christ, they were saying he was the worst criminal. And so they didn't put him on the side. They put him in the middle. Now, my brothers and sisters, this, now the superlative, they're not saying that this is a crime. This is the superlative, not in the worst, but it's superlative, guess what direction? The best. And it's hung out of the White House. Now, when has this ever happened before? You know, we've never seen this. Now, what does it mean? You know what that picture is? This is in World War II. During the time of the Holocaust and the Nazi regime. But here, as the forces of America came in, these are a group of Marines. I don't know if my brother Ricardo was here, but these are a group of Marines right here. And they're going on, and, and what does that mean? Anybody know what that means? Anybody know what that means? That's a symbol of something. They're putting up this American flag, and brother said it's a symbol of victory, of conquest. What does it mean to fly the LGBT flag in America? In the very seat of the nation. What does it mean? Talk to me, somebody. Don't be afraid to talk. Conquest, victory. Look at the flag. Once, and we're going to prove this by the grace of God, not today, but we're going to prove, that once LGBT conquers a nation, it collapses. In every history, the last predominant social condition before a nation collapsed is homosexuality. Now, my brothers and sisters, it was that way in Babylon. It was that way in Media Persia. It was that way in Greece. It was that way in Rome. It was that way in Israel. It was that way in, uh, you say Israel. You know, the Jewish nation were homosexuals. I don't have time to begin to that right now. Solomon, Gamar, everything was this way. Now, my brothers and sisters, what do they call that? They call it what? They call it what? Pride. The Bible says that pride before the fall. So once we see this, well, you don't need a man to come and tell you that we're at the end. You don't need me to show you article after article. You in your mind should look at that and say, I know what this means without even a date. I see the crack. What it says is that the historians are right. The history of redemption is right. And the only one that is wrong is you and me. And someone says, I asked somebody before, I don't believe that. You know, I, I don't believe that. I, have you studied the history of how nations collapse? Well, I never studied it, but I don't believe it. It's amazing how we have proof for something we have never studied. You go to every field. You can go to any field and see the exact same thing. And we're not experts, and you can go to the expert, and the expert will tell you we're at the end of everything. You never study it, but, but, but we want to deny the weight of evidence. My brothers and sisters, those who deny the weight of evidence, they die. It was that way in the flood. Those who denied the weight of biblical evidence, they didn't. They, no, it's not going to. And 
and tell me something, in Nazi Germany. You know that Hitler wrote a book called Mein Kampf long before he came to power. And inside he spoke out everything we're talking about now. And at the universities, they were studying his book. And they came to Germany and said, Jews, you better get out. Brothers and sisters, get out of here because if he rise to power. And they said, well, we heard this before. This literally happened. We heard this before. Why would it be any different now? But those who came to that decision, they died. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to get it right, we got to get it right now. Amen. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you remember what we're doing? Do you remember what we're doing? We said we're going to break this study up into three parts. How many parts? We said into three parts. I'm going to pass on this. I think you got it. I got it. I'm looking at it. I believe we know we should be praying. Lord, give us a little more time. But three things. Let me thank you. What's the, what the first thing that, we, that we're looking at to understand what we're saying? What's the first thing? We're trying to understand the problems that exist. But look at it this way. Number one. First, we're going to study what the problem is that you and I are facing as a people. This will help us to understand the trouble, not that's coming, but the trouble that we are, because we are in trouble. Are we in trouble, yes or no? We're in trouble. Number two. No, let me back up. Number two. I was getting ready to put it up there, but I'm going to test you again. What's number two? What are we doing number two? Then we need to analyze. You can't just look at a problem and look at it. We've got to analyze. Then we've got to analyze the problem so that we uh, intelligently understand how we got into the trouble that we're in. Where is it leading, and how close are we until there's no way? You know, a problem can get so bad that there's no way to escape. You know that right now that when a person is in a flood and they drive through, sometimes one of the worst deaths of the flood, they drive into the water, and all of a sudden the water comes rushing into the car. You know, there's only a window of opportunity for them to get out before they're dead. Do you know that in 2023 we have a small window left? Whatever we do, we got to do fast. I'm saying we got to get together fast. And understand as a team, I'm interested in all of us as a family making it, not just one. I want us as, as a shepherd, I'm caring about every one of us. Are you understanding what I'm saying? God wants all of us to make it. Now, once we see where we are, how close we are to that, then what do we do number three? What's number three now? Then we finally need to study the solution that God and his plan has given us of what we can do how. How? As fast as possible to come out of this problem and the satanic trap that it is designed to totally enslave and then exterminate us. We can get out if we move, not tomorrow. We've got to move when? You remember 2 Corinthians 6? I told you to turn there. I'm not going to read it, but you put it in your notes. Verse 2, it says, now is the acceptable time. Now. We must move now. Do you want to get ready? Yes or no? Let us pray. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're in a great crisis right now. And we cannot make it without you. We need you, Lord, to help us as we study into this series going further so that we can get ready before it is too late. And not just us, but there's a world that is counting on us if we would simply grab hold of the hand of Jesus. Your hand, O oh God. We pray, Lord, that you would remove me. I'm fickle, I'm feeble, I'm frail. But, Lord, you're, you're strong, you're mighty, you're intelligent. You have all wisdom in heaven and earth. And I pray that you would impart that to us. Give us the ability to understand. Wipe out our TikTok mind and give us the mind of heaven so that we may know Jesus as a friend. Bless us now as we study. Remove every distraction. And Lord, I pray that you would not allow us to be careless in this room, that you would help us to sense the spirit of urgency to run to Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. What book did I say? You're going to 1 Peter chapter 4. We want to move quickly. 1 Peter chapter 4. And we want to notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter the 4th chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, never in the history of the world have we been in a time when so much depended on so much as it does in this final generation? The only other time that was as critical as this was in Gethsemane and the cross. To the seed and now to the remnant of the seed that the entire universe was trembling in the balances. Now, brothers and sisters, right now today, God is trying to wake us up because he recognizes that the entire world has no idea of what's about to take place. And God has given you and I light from heaven. So that we could see that tonight we're on the verge of a great and stupendous crisis. And everywhere you turn in society, no matter what field of knowledge, you can see it. 
politically, economically, socially, religiously, environmentally. I don't care what you look at, the handwriting is on the wall, and it all says the same thing, that we're getting ready to collapse, that the world is going down. And the only thing that can help us is Jesus. If ever there's a time to run to Jesus, it's now. If ever there's a time to get our families ready, it's now. If ever there was a time to understand the plan of God, it's now. I cannot overemphasize to us that the end of all things is at hand. In fact, look what the Bible says in 1 Peter. What book did I say? 1 Peter chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4. And we want to look at uh, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. You're there, amen? Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? But the end of all things is at hand. What should we do? Go to sleep? No, it says, Be ye therefore sober and do what? Watch how? Unto prayer. We should be watching and praying like Jesus told us. You remember in Gethsemane? While Jesus was praying and awake, the disciples were what? And this reason says, In that sleeping disciples was a representation of a sleeping church when to be found sleep is most perilous or dangerous. If ever there was a time to sleep, it's not right now. Wake up. You know, there's going to come a time. Jesus woke up those, his disciples three times. But at the third time, it was midnight. And at the third time at midnight, he told them, sleep on. Wake up, but sleep on. In other words, they would physically wake up, but spiritually, they would still be sleeping. I'm telling you something. 2023, we have two options. Wake up or sleep on. I promise you, the thing we need to do now is wake up. That's the only way we're going to make it. Now, as we look at the crisis at the end of all things at hand, you know that it does not take a rocket scientist like Von Braun to see this. It doesn't take, brothers and sisters, a man with a degree in history or a degree in sociology or a degree in psychology or a degree in theology. It doesn't take a man with a degree in anything. All you have to do is open up your eyes, and if you and I will look with intelligence, we can see that time cannot continue much longer. And this is why God is telling us that if we see what's happening, we should be trying to get an understanding that will move us in a position where we can be ready for what's coming. Not just us, but he, God wants to help the world. Is a time of trouble coming, yes or no? Go to Daniel 12. What book did I say? Go to Daniel 12. You know, inspiration tells us that something is coming to this continent, to this country, to this world, more serious and severe than anything we witness. Watch what the prophet says. Talking about this very thing. Watch what the prophet says. Talking about this time. It says, Great Calibration 622, it says, the time of what? Trouble such as never was is soon to open up upon us, and we shall need not just information. We shall need an experience in which many do not now what? Possess. We don't have it right now. And which many are too indolent to obtain. And the prophet says, it is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. In other words, we think that it's bad. In other words, we, we think sometimes that uh, sometimes we, we think that the trouble is bad, but then when the trouble actually comes, you say it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. But you know what the prophet says? This is not true of the what? Of the crisis before us. It says the most vivid Presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In other words, the prophet had to put a pen down, said, I cannot even write how terrible it's going to be if we go through that time. No one can go through it through another. We must all have a personal relationship with Jesus for ourselves. Parent can't do it for child. Child can't do it for parent. I can't save my daughter. My daughter can't save me. I can't save my wife. My wife can't save me. You can't save each other, but Jesus can. Jesus saves. I've heard a joyful sound. What did it say? Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around. Why? Jesus saves. If we come to Jesus, he can save us. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, the perils of the last days are what? Upon us. Now, what does upon us mean? Up on us. It's right on top of us. It says... And in our work, we are to not entertain the people. We are to what? Warn the people of the danger that is coming. Now, Daniel 12, 1 says there's a time of trouble that's coming in the future. But I'm not preaching about that right now. I'm not going to read it now. I'm not going to preach about that right now. I'm telling us that, yes, a greater time of trouble is coming, but you and I are in trouble right now. We're in danger, not tomorrow, not 2025. We're in danger when? Right now. Now, it says, warn the people of the danger they are in 
Let not the solemn scenes this prophecy has revealed be left what? Somebody said, I don't want to touch it. God said, somebody got to touch it. It says, if our people were what? Wake up, not sleep on. If our people were half awake, if they realize the nearness of the events portrayed in the revelation, if they realize what? If we realize the what? God wants us to understand how near we are to this crisis. The Bible says in that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer. Romans 13, 11. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. It says God wants us to realize the nearness of the events portrayed in the revelation, and then it says what would happen if we did that? A reformation would be wrought there in our churches, and many more would be what? Believe the message. We have no time to lose. God calls upon us to watch for souls as they that must give an account. You know, brothers and sisters, if we are seven day Adventists, we have been privileged with light that we could share with family and friends and neighbors. And if we don't share that light, their blood will be on our hands. You know, inspiration said in a little book called Reflecting Christ, it says a trouble breakdown. Someone says, I knew it was coming, but I didn't know it was going to come so soon. And then there were other voices that said, we did not know. We did not know. Why did you not get acquainted with us and tell us? There's a work for us to do. What do you say, brothers and sisters? God wants us to understand something. I want to ask you a question. Do you remember what we were studying yesterday? Do you remember what we were studying? Do you remember the name of the series we're studying? Do you remember? What is the name of the series we're studying? The Final Solution. Very good. That's right. Not just the final solution, but the final solution, then what? We must move now. Now, did I make that name up, or was that a name from history? Tell me, what was the final solution about? What, what was it about? Talk to me quickly. What was it about? Was it a place in history, yes or no? Where did it take place? Location. Germany. Who was leading out? What government? What type of government was leading out? Nazi Germany. What was the plan? What was the plan in that final solution? What was the plan? To kiss every Jew. To eliminate every Jew. And you know, they make up names for the things. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Let me go a little further. Nazi Germany's final solution. It took high-ranking Nazis just an hour and a half to definitely pass judgment on Europe's Jews, millions of them. They met at a little villa called what? Von C. Villa. June 22nd, 1941. It says the displacement of the Jews to the east represents the start of the final solution. The Nazis and the, their henchmen murdered at least how many? Six million Jewish people during their genocide in less than four years. Now, you know how many people you have to kill a day in order to do that? That's, you have to have a death factory in order to do that. You have to have a factory, not a food factory, but a death factory. And they had some. You know what they were called? You know what the main death factory was called? Auschwitz. They had one in Treblinka. They had one in Sobibar. They had one in Poland. You start going through the names, and I, we've studied, our family studied the history of this over and over again in different places. We love the history. And my brother and sister, when you read it, you know that you're just reading the history of seven day Adventists. You better understand this. It says approximately two thirds of Europe, European Jews were killed, wiped out of existence. You know how much two thirds did? That means out of every three people, two of them died. Can you imagine on this road? You say, I don't want you to use this road, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> this road, there's 10 shares in this row. And in this 10 shares, that means that three of the 10 shares, at least over three of you would have to die. You know that happened in the entire room? You would almost annihilate everybody on this campus. But we're going to find out that Satan's plan is not to take out two-thirds and send them in. So no. Satan has a plan of all or nothing. Satan does not do anything casually. He wants to take out every single solitary seven Adventist. And if it were not for God and his plan, he would be successful. My brothers and sisters, God is trying to warn us of this time. See, in Nazi Germany, something was happening very interesting. Now look what this says. I'm going to put this up here now. You see, you, you see how the enemy don't like this? Can someone quickly get on the computer, please? Can someone quickly get on the computer? Thank you. Now look what it says. <laughs> Father, we praise you. Take control of the little equipment. Bless us so that we can understand. Help us to see what's before us. In Jesus' name, amen. German and police murdered nearly 
two million, uh, over two million Jews in the killing uh, centers, either by asphyxiation, you know what that means? Or you suffocate, uh, with poison gas in the gas chambers, or by shooting. In its entirety, the final solution called for the murder of the European Jews by gassing, shooting, and other means. Six million Jewish men, women, and, and what's that next word? These are children being marched to their death right now. I'm going to tell you something. The final solution targeted young people. It targeted them. The soon as a young person there, sometimes they sent the older ones to labor camps, to concentration camps, to become not soft slaves but hard slaves. But the young person, they killed them. They wanted to separate families. That was one of the very goals of it, to separate the families and destroy them. Is it happening today, yes or no? If you're a seven Adventist, you have a target on your mind back. The final solution wanted to target family and separate and wipe out the entire youth population. It wants to wipe out every young seven Adventist today. I'm going to tell you something. Satan is doing his job well. But God is going to get an army of young people that are going to say, you know what, I don't care what the devil is doing, I'm going to follow. I know some of them in this room. What do you say? Now look at this. The Holocaust and a few pictures. I won't go through this, but it's talking about the time when the Holocaust started. Now, why am I studying with you what happened with the Jew? Someone said, I'm not Jewish. Why am I studying with you what happened to the Jew? If, if we just study for history's sake, that might be all right. But I'm not just studying this with you for that purpose. Why are we studying what happened to the Jew? Talk to me somebody. The Bible says, as it hath been, so shall it be. There is nothing what new under the sun. Do you know that no one in this room can deny the fact that it's impossible, impossible, to understand the present and prepare for the future without having some knowledge of the past. You know, that in order to understand what's happening now and what's going to happen, you've got to look at history, the past, and understand for ourselves what took place. And we're studying this because those who will not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. God wants to say that this should never happen again to the people of God. God is trying to prevent this. Now, my brothers and sisters, this final solution, Satan's final solution is much worse than anything that ever happened in Nazi Germany. I told you yesterday that Satan's final solution would make the German Nazi final solution look like a walk in the park. As the people of God approach the present last day, Satan holds on this consultation with his angels to the most successful plan of what? Overthrowing their third question. Did you read your hand out last night? Was it serious? If you didn't get a handout, I, I don't know if I brought it now, but I'm, I, you need to make sure you get that handout. We looked at Satan's final solution where God showed us Satan meeting with his angels, consulting and conferencing with them, showing how to destroy seven Adventists. It says, that's the most of Genesis 473. But our principal concern is to what? How do you think it means silence? You think it just means to cover the mouth with the hand? Wipe them out, kill, murder, genocide, religious genocide. To silence this, not every sect, but what? This sect of Sabbath keepers, we must excite popular indignation against them. We will enlist great men, worldly wise men upon our side, and induce those in authority to carry out what? Our purposes. Then the Sabbath, which I have set up, shall be enforced by laws the most severe and exacting. Now, if you remember, if you looked at the hand last night, you saw that there are phases, that that's not the, this is the final solution, but there are some soft solutions first. Remember that? Before going to that extreme. But it says, those who disregard them shall be driven out from the cities and villages. But praise God, if you've been following God's plan, that won't, mind, that won't matter right there. And made to suffer hunger and privation. When once we have the power, we will share what we can do. We led the Roman church to imprisonment, torture, death, and upon those who refuse to yield their decrees. And now that we are bringing what? The Protestant churches and the world into harmony with this right arm of our strength. Look at what Satan says. We will finally have a law to... Two-thirds of seven Adventists. We will finally have a law to exterminate how much? All who will not submit to our authority. When death shall be made the penalty of violating what? Ourselves. That's what he said. He's going to silence this particular say. Now this is the quotation. I say 614 last night, but it was 618. Three verse 618. It says, as Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so he will stir up the wicked to destroy who? Who? God's people in the time of trouble. And as he accused Jacob, he will urge accusations against the people of God. It says, he numbers. Let's read, let's read this together. Watch what this says. Let's read this together. It says, he numbers the world as the world already is. Popular churches already is. It says, but the 
little tough company. Who is that talking to me? Give me a name. Give me a name. Seven big Adventists. The little company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. Now look what it says. Condition. What? If he could what? Block them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. You know that most people do not know that Satan has not lost the great controversy right now. The cross did not finish the great controversy. Some say, it was all done at the cross. But no, 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 no. When he said it is finished, he was talking about only a part of, the, uh, of that great controversy, not the whole thing. If you ever watched football before, before you knew better, let me say that again. That was too silent. Have you ever watched football before you knew better? Unless you think that God made football. You think in heaven we're going to be playing football? We're going to say, good, get, we're going to black, good God, I'm going to knock you down. Such a spirit is foreign to the character of Christ. Now, if I don't know that, does God condemn me because I don't know that? God, so you're going to hell because you watch football? Is that how God is? No. But he wants us to learn. The Bible says, my people are destroyed for a lack of, he's not interested in condemnation, but in what? Education. He's trying to help us. Now, my brothers and sisters, God is trying to show us something in, in, in football. You know there's something called halftime. At halftime, one of the, some of the greatest worldly shows take place. They bring in all the, the so-called greatest star entertainment stars. And if a person didn't know the game of football, he would think that the game was over. Because all of the celebration. Am I right? But the game is not over. It's only what? There's still another half that has to be played. Now, do you know that no one knows that the game of life is not over but Seventh-day Adventists? That when Jesus died on the cross, what he was saying is that it is half time. That the first half was finished. The work of the earth was done in the outer court. His work as a lamb was done, but his work as a priest had just begun. No one knows that. But a little group of people called Seventh-day Adventists, and Satan says, if I can wipe them off the earth, I can win the game. Satan is playing for keeps. Are you understand? You know, there came a time in one place that was called the last Jew. The last Jew. The last Jew. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a real body of Jews inside of a cave here on, on, on the earth. They dug this hole and then they were shot and killed inside. Of it. And then it says here, the last Jew in Venitsa. Anybody from Ukraine, please forgive me for chopping that name up. This is a western Ukrainian city and right above him is the last Jew that's getting ready to be killed in the final solution in that city. Wiped out the entire Jewish population from Western Ukraine. You want to see him? Look at how his face is right here. All the SS Nazis are looking at him. He has his gun before his head. His eyes are open. He's looking down, looking ahead. This is the last Jew. This is a famous picture. Can you imagine that Satan wants to do that to every young seven day Adventist and every adult? And God is looking for every family to protect our homes right now. And the weapons of our warfare is not carnal. It's not us going out and getting Uzis and saying, oh, I'm ready for them now. We need Jesus, brothers and sisters. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? There is a final solution. Someone say, well, that's, that's there. Now, you know, there will come a time when Satan wants to destroy the last seven day Adventist. So that there's not even a remnant. Then his triumph, he feels, will be complete. And so in Nazi Germany, they met to try to do that. And what were the steps? First, what? Exclude from the side. What was the second step? Cut out of the economy. No more business, no more commerce. What was the third step? Put into the what? Ghetto. What was the fourth step? What was the fifth step? What's soft slavery? That means they just touch you softly? That means you're a slave, but you don't know it. Where are we in 2023? Where are we in 2023? Where are we in 2023? Soft slavery. What's getting ready to happen? When? Twenty twenty five plus or minus. We have but a little window left to get ready for this. I'm praying, Lord, give us a few more years. That God can extend it as long as possible. I would rather be called Jonah. Unless somebody live, but this is this is fact. There is a limit. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. 
What comes after hard slavery? Death, extermination, religious genocide. Do you know that God wants us to understand this history? Now, I'm going to go through this another time. But I need to pass on this to get to a place before, before we get into the heart and, and what have you. I need to, I'm going to pass on this, but we're going to go back and find out. Do you know there is no way to be, go through the crisis without understanding history? Did you know that? You know that we're told in Prophets and Kings 608 and 609 that when uh, the Babylonian captivity took place, that Ezra studied sacred history and had a thorough conversion because he saw history, understood it, and he began to start seeing the footsteps of Jehovah. As he studied the character of God, the principles of God, and it converted him as he looked at Jesus in his way. And by God's grace, a change took place and he sought to master it so he could teach his people. You know, the Bible tells us that in order to endure, we're going to have to study history. And what is the number one thing the devil doesn't want us to understand? Talk to me somebody. History. What's the number one thing that he wants us to get bored with? History. Because if you understand history, you know what's getting ready to take place. Then you know what you and I need to do in order to get through this history. Why did the, why, let's go back to some history for just a few moments. Let's go back to some history. Why did the Nazi Germany hate the Jew? Somebody talk to me. Why did Nazi Germany, we're in the class, talk to me. Why did the Nazi Germany hate the Jew? What was his reason? He just, he just all of a sudden just said, I hate Jews. Is that, is that what it was? They, they were blamed for everything, but uh, that, that's true. Give me, give me a little more. They were, they were blamed for everything. That's very good. They were blamed for everything. What do you say? They were blamed for the loss of World War I. Very, very significant, my brother. Sound like you've been studying some history. I see a little glow about you right now. <laughs> see your hand, yes. Right stage five, five. Very good, very good. Uh, but my God, we're, we're participating, praise the Lord. Let me, let me say this. Has there ever been another time when every Jew was sought to be eliminated? When? You better, you better, you better watch this. During the time of Esther. You know the prophet says that what's going to happen with the son in law will be very similar to what happened to the time of Esther. I got past on that. I got past on that. This is a famous picture right here. Any historian who knows about World War II knows this is a famous picture right here. This is a picture, a propaganda picture the Nazi Germany put out. Here's supposed to be a fictitious picture of a Jew, and he's stabbing the military in the back. It was called the uh, it was called the stab in the back myth. You can look it up in history. The stab in the back myth. The stab in the back myth. According to this conspiracy theory, the German army had not been defeated on the battlefield, but because social democratic politicians had signed the truce in order to take what control. In reality, the army command had been made of mistakes, but they were putting it on the Jew. Even knowing the war fabrications were circulating about the supposed lack of patriotism among the German Jews. It, uh, the, the slanderous propaganda such as the stab in the back myth contributed to anti-Semitism and hatred. Stab in the back myth. Historically, entire groups have been what? The, look at the word that's chose to be used. You can see in God's final solution, the scapegoats plays a part. Am I right? It says in Nazi Germany, Hitler and his army scapegoated the what? Jewish people. See, what they did to the Jewish people, they should have done to the real problem. We need to eliminate the real problem. Now, I, didn't, I, I, I get ahead of us. The real problem is sin. God's going to give a holocaust. You know the word holocaust? You know what it means, holocaust? Hala, whole, cost, burn. It actually is the word in the Jewish for a burnt offering. Do you know that, brothers and sisters, that what is God going to do in the last days to sin? He's going to burn it up. That is the final solution to it all. But God can't do that right now because there's a problem. How can God save the sinner without saving sin? How can God destroy sin without the sinners? He has a problem. And in the sanctuary, God reveals how he's going to do it. To the Nazi mind, the problem was what? The Nazi declared that the Jew to be the reason for their social societal ills and further believed that if he eliminated the Jewish people, then their problems would be, hence, the final solution. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Final solution. So they thought that the reason why they were having social problems was because of the Jew. The reason why they were having economic problems was because of the Jew. The reason why they were having problems in the environment, the Jew. The Jew. No food, starvation, the Jew. Would that ever happen to a seven Adventist? 
The bill said the reason why we're having floods and hurricanes, the reason why we're having economic hardship, the reason why we're having political difference and civil war and revolution is because of a little group of people honoring the seventh day Sabbath. Everything is going to be turned against us. Go to the book of Jonah. What book did I say? Go to Jonah, chapter 1. Look at Jonah, chapter 1. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Jonah. Jonah, chapter 1. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. I want to show you that the problem with the final solution was not their solution. It was that they had the wrong problem. They did not understand the problem. And by not understanding the problem, they could not come together with the right solution. You understand what I'm telling you? They misunderstood the problem. You and I are going to analyze so we understand the problem. Now, I'm going to show you the right problem here in the Bible in Jonah chapter 1. I want you to notice this in Jonah the first chapter. And notice how powerful the Bible is. You know that here God is trying to give us some more understanding of the plan of redemption. That's the burden of every passage of the Bible. Look at Jonah chapter 1. Are you there? Amen. Verse 1 says, Now in the word of the Lord came into Jonah the son of Amittai, as saying, Arise, go where? Go where? You know the story. Where did Jonah go? Did Jonah go in the same direction or the opposite? And many of us are like Jonah. We're running from God. Many adults and young people are like Jonah, running from the calling that God has put upon us. But I know what the Bible says. It goes on. It says in verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great what? Wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. How did the men, were the men uh, uh, courageous or were they afraid it was about to take place? And all of a sudden, as that storm seemed to be there, they wanted to get rid of everything that was in the way to try to survive and keep themselves. But then something happened. Look what the Bible says in verse 5. Then the, the mariners were afraid and cried every man into his God and cast forth their wares that were in the ship and in the sea to lighten it from them. Let's read this together. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. He lay and was what? Talk to me, somebody. Wake up or sleep on. He was fast asleep. Now, I want to ask you the question. Was there a storm on that sea right now? Yes or no? Was there a storm on that sea? Who was the problem? Jonah. So then what is the solution to that problem? Get Jonah out of there. You understand? Now, look what happened. The Bible says in verse 6, So the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. How can we be sleeping at a time like this in 2023? How can we sleep? We should be calling upon the name of God. Help us, O oh Lord. But now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says in verse 7, And they said, Everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause the evil is upon us. Can you imagine? They cast lots, and God directed the lot. And let the lot fall upon Jonah. And they said, You're the man. You know, God can control anything. You know that, right? So the Bible says, uh, and, and, and fill upon John, verse 8. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose, what's the next word? So what did they do? They were trying to identify the cause of the problem. You said, anytime you have a problem, you have to identify the cause or you'll come up to a wrong solution. If a man's sick, how do you start to try to heal that man? First, we must ascertain the cause. But we will not have the ministry of healing. That's the first thing, to understand the cause. And so they begin to try to understand this cause. This is evil upon us. What is thine occupation? In other words, what job? Oh, are you doing a, a bad job, brother? It says, what, what is thine occupation? What comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people are thou? Verse 9, and he said unto them, I am a what? He blew. I fear the Lord. He said, I, know, I serve the God who made all this you're looking at. Verse 10, then they were exceedingly afraid. They said, well, then you did do it. For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Verse 11. Then said they unto him, what shall we do? You know what he said? He said, if you get rid of me, the, the storm will stop. Did they want to get rid of him? No, they had compassion. They said, we don't want to do that. And so they began to start throwing off everything. They start throwing off their televisions. They start throwing off all their, the, the, the food that they had that wasn't right. They start throwing all it out. The storm didn't stop. And so finally... They said, you know what? We better go do what he says. And they threw Jonah overboard. And guess what happened? The storm stopped. Why? Jonah was the problem. The elimination of Jonah brought a solution. Do you understand? If the Jew was the problem, then the elimination of the Jew would have brought the solution. But the Jew wasn't the problem. That was a misunderstanding of the problem. Now, in case you don't know, what we're studying right now, yesterday we were talking about uh, 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 sleep, not, uh, uh, sleep uh, wake up or sleep on. We never got to the wake up or sleep on, but you understand. But now we're studying 
understanding the problem. Understanding what? Are we in trouble, yes or no? Do we have a problem? Then we got to better understand the problem we're in or we'll never understand how to get out of it. See, when I say final what, when I say final what, final what, what does that suggest? That name, final solution, suggests two things, two great things. Number one, if I say a uh, 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 solution, what does that suggest? What does that suggest? If I don't look for a solution unless I have a, and so you notice then that there would have to be a condition of a problem that existed. You would not look for a solution unless you first had a problem. Are you with me? Number two, the name suggests final solution. Not only does it suggest that there must be a problem, but if it's final, what does that suggest? It's not the first, but it is the, so that means that there's more to the plan than just that. There's something that came before that. Now, my brothers and sisters, you and I have to understand this because we cannot wait until the final in order to get it right. We have to get, it, get this right before the window closes. Now, my brothers and sisters, as we study this, we begin to see. As we study this, we begin to see that the elimination of the Jew, if the Jew was the problem, then the final solution would have made sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it was not the problem. They did not understand the problem. Number one, we want to, what is the problem? This is what we're studying. This is what we need to understand. Number one, what do we need to understand? What is the problem that has created the trouble that we're in? And yes, we are in trouble. Someone said, I don't know if we're in trouble. Yes, we're in trouble. We're in trouble right now. Not coming, we're in it. Can you imagine that even before the Jew got into the concentration camp, he was in trouble? Number two, what are the results of the problem in our experience how? Individually and what else? Now, do you know that the problem, there was an individual Jewish problem that affected individual families, but there was also a larger problem that, ex that affected every Jew. And that's seven evidence, there's individual problems that are affected, that you and I are going to be affected with, and there's going to be something that affects the entire domination. We have to see both of the answers. Number three, how close are we until the problem turns into a what? See, whenever we don't follow God's plan, it turns into a problem. And a problem unaddressed turns into a crisis. What happens if, my high, if I have high blood pressure and I don't deal with that high blood pressure? I can, go into a, I can go into a crisis, am I right? What happens if I have diabetes but I don't manage the diabetes by following God's plan? What will happen? I go into what is called a diabetic crisis. So now, my brothers and sisters, this is telling us that if we do not fix the problem that we're in in 2023, if we don't fix the problem individually as a family, our family will be in crisis and the church will be in crisis and there will be no way to go forward. And I'm going to tell you right now, every Seventh-day Adventist family in this world is in a crisis right now. Your home and my home. And we need to understand how to solve this problem. The entire denomination is in a crisis. And we have not seen the solution to this. And God is trying to bring us back to understand this cause. And we need to see how close we are until the problem turns into a crisis. And what type of crisis? Now, do you know that there's an event that shows us when the crisis will be permanent and that there is no remedy? You know, there's an event that tells us when the crisis, the window, the door shuts, and there's no way that we can fix the problem. Did that ever happen in the flood? Yes or no? Did it ever happen that the problem became so bad in the world that though there was a window of opportunity to get ready, that the door finally shut and there was nothing else they could do? Did it ever happen? When? When? Did that happen at any time or was there a limit? So at the end of the 120-year limit, the door was shut. And my brothers and sisters, we would call that the close of probation. Do you know that this is happening right now? And do you know, listen to me, do you know that every seven day minutes, young and old, Right now, you may have some called liberal, some historic, some whatever. But I'm going to tell you something. If the summer law passes, every seven Adventist will wake up. Everyone, even the man that says, I don't believe in God or the Bible or, or the prophet. The one that says, I, I was forced to come to a meeting or forced to come to church. That man will wake up and say, man, this is what we always say. What do we do now? All ten virgins woke up. All ten of them. Even the ones that were unprepared woke up. And they recognize, Lord, we're not ready, we're not ready, we're not ready. What do we do now? But for some, the window closed, the door was shut. And I'm telling us today, we have just a little opportunity to get this thing right. And Jesus has brought us here for such a time as this. This is why you can't sit down talking and, and being careless. You should be praying, Lord, please help me to understand so I can understand the problem and then understand and find the solution. Amen? Now, 
How close are we into the problem turns into a crisis, an irreversible crisis? There's an event. You know that when the Bible says in Esther 8.8, 8, write that down your notes, Esther 8.8. 8. In Esther 8.8 8, it said, when the king sealed, in the time of Esther, it said the king sealed it with his name. And he said that when he sealed something, that it could not be reversed. Do you know that when the sealing takes place, it shows that we reach a condition that is irreversible? Whether the seal is the mark of the beast or the seal of God, it is irreversible. That's straight eight. Seals always show us that. Now, then finally, is it enough just to understand the problem? Yes or no? Yes or no? It says, what is the inspired what? Solution to my problem. Not, not, not your solution. Not my solution. I'm not wise enough to come up with a solution. And if it was your solution, I wouldn't trust it. <laughs> but in order for it to work, it has to be, guess whose solution? God's solution. A divine solution, an inspired solution. And God wants you and I to understand it. Now, these are the four things we have to do. We won't finish it all. We're getting really close. But my brothers and sisters, we want to understand the problem. This is what we're doing now. Our study today is understanding the problem. This, we, we, we won't be able to finish it, but we're trying to understand the problem so that we can get and analyze it and get some solutions. What do you say? That we can work together as a team and get out of the problem so we can be saved. Do you want some solutions, yes or no? Here's where they met. Here's Satan's solution now. Not Nazi Germany anymore. Look at what, look at what Satan is trying to accomplish. It says, Testimonies to Ministers 472, as the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels to the most successful plan of doing what? Overloading their faith. He's, trying, he's coming up with the final solution. Now look what it says. Let's read this together. It says, he what? Sees that the popular churches are already laid asleep from by his deceptive power. The church is already deceived. By pleasing sophistry and lying wonders, he can continue to hold them under his control. Therefore, he directs his angels to lay their snares. What's the next word? Especially. Especially for who? For those who are looking for the... Who would you call that looking for the second advent? That's an Adventist. It says looking for the second advent of Christ and endeavoring to keep what? So that's not just an Adventist. That's a seven-day Adventist. Satan says destroy them. How can we overthrow them? Says the deceiver, we must watch those who are calling attention of the people to the Sabbath of Jehovah. Now watch what he says. Watch what he says. Why? They will lead many. Now that's number one. I'm diagramming this for you and I. Number one, it says the Sabbath of Jehovah. Why? They will lead many to see the claims of what? You know, in order to prove that this fourth commandment is binding, you have to show that the Ten Commandments are binding. You know that, right? Then it says, and the same light which reveals the true Sabbath reveals, listen, also reveals also the ministration of Christ where? So the Sabbath, the law, the heavenly sanctuary, and then it says, and shows that the, not first word, but the final word. Some about the final solution. The last word for man's salvation is what? In other words, Satan understands that the work is not finished. But he makes every other church, evangelical church, think that the work is finished because if you think it's over, you don't try to run a race. You don't try to win a game if you think the game is over. Can you imagine a team that was down by three, but they thought the game was over. They just get up and walk away. They, they lost. They just kind of leave the, the, the stadium. They lost. But brothers and sisters, Satan has not lost. He can still win if he stops Jesus from finishing the work. Now, this says, Hold, this is Satan talking. Hold the minds. Hold the what? This is Satan's plan. Hold the minds of the people in darkness. We're in that forever. That's not what he's doing. Till that work is, he says, all you have to do is hold them until the priest finishes his work. Because he knows that there's a time for the priest to finish his work. And he knows that if the priest does not finish his work on, he loses the game. You say, what do I mean? Anybody ever played basketball before you knew better? <laughs> That's not our study. Listen to me. Have you ever seen a man? They're down by two. They're down by what? Three seconds left on the clock. Now, normally a team shouldn't uh, try to do something much like that. They normally run the ball. You run the clock. You know what I'm talking about. Throw the ball around and what happens? What happens now if the opposing team that's down by two gets the ball? What's his plan? To go in and shoot a layup? He will be a fool. I would say he didn't play basketball before. <laughs> he has to shoot from downtown. Am I right? 
There's a knockout of three. Why? Because that's the only way a, a true player is playing not to tie the game. He's playing to win. The devil doesn't play the tie. He's playing to win. And he flatters himself that he will obtain the victory. Now, my brothers and sisters, now imagine two seconds left to go. Michael gets the ball. You know, years ago when Chicago Bulls were the team, Michael Jordan, if they were down by two, they didn't give the ball to nobody but Michael Jordan. Am I right? And he was looking for it. And all of a sudden, Michael get the ball, and he's just looking. You know, he put his tongue out at that time. You know, you know it. Don't act like you never saw it. <laughs> and when he put that tongue out, you knew it was over. And brothers and sisters, many times you would have seen him win that game even though they had been down by two. Am I right? I'm going to tell you something. That Michael is a cheap imitation. Now, the man is worth precious because he's a soul, a child of God. I'm talking about in comparison to the real Michael. I'm talking about Michael. See, when Michael stands up, that's the, that's the real Michael. The other is Antichrist. <laughs> no, no, he's not Antichrist. You understand what I'm, what I'm saying? Now, one thing was Antichrist blasphemous. I better point that out. Now, the man himself, by the grace of God, he's a child of God, Michael Jordan. God loves everybody. Am I right? But I remember when he left the game, he came back. They said the return, the second return of Michael. I said they knew something they were saying. And they put him coming in the clouds. They had him coming in the clouds. I didn't know that at the time. At the time, I just said, whoa, whoa. That's blasphemy. You and I would look up to a Michael like that when we have a greater Michael. And our Michael, he's looking for the ball too. And this man, our Michael, has never lost. He's never missed a shot. That other Michael, he's missed some before. But not this one. He's, he, and he's not a goat. Now some of you know what I'm talking about. The goat gets taken out of the camp. The goat gets taken out of the camp. And those who know sports know what I'm talking about. Only the lamb remains. Now, my brothers and sisters, but that two down, two seconds left to go in the clock. What would happen if he's getting ready to shoot and the ball leaves his hand and there's a split second on the shot clock and it leaves his hand? If he makes it, what happens? He wins. But let me ask you a question now. Has there ever been a time when it's been so close that they go in slow motion? I've seen it. They play it back again and again. And what are they looking for? What are they looking for? Tell me what they're looking for. They're looking. Did it leave his hand before the time ran out? Now, what happens? And, and there's been a game where a person, they jump out, we won, we won, we won. And they went back and found out they didn't leave his hand on time. What happens to that team? The goal now is not basketball. The goal is the game of life. And the only way for the priest, Michael, to win the game, when he stands up, he must come out of the most holy place on time with the sins of all believers. He must have a sinless generation that he can take all that sins and it must happen before the clock runs out or he loses the game. No other church knows that but us. And so if you were the devil, talk to me, somebody, what would you do? I would say, I got to destroy them. Massive apocalyptic floodgate and car tunnels to fend off the next big storm. It shows all the flood. I don't want to go through that. We'll come back to that. This says, for how long there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be what? He, we must be prepared for this issue. This is like God is giving. Do you understand? We are just at the point where we're going to want to, we're going to, want to get out, but we're not going to be able. They're talking about having this little gate that they set up that they can actually close the gate in all of these different cities. Oh, come on. They, 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 they pass on that. Satan wants to stop what? Talk to me, somebody. What does he want to stop? And the only way that can happen, head be crushed. Jesus must leave the most holy place on time with all of the sins of the congregation, leaving this congregation a what? Sin in this congregation. Let's close in the book of 16. What book did I say? Let's close in the book of 16. Let's close in the book of 16. This is the issue. 
to bring Jesus out of the most holy place on time. And do you know that we can never do that unless somebody is brought back to a sinless state? Look what the Bible says in Leviticus 16. Why am I going to Leviticus 16? What is Leviticus 16 about? Talk to me, somebody. The day of the entire chapter. Look at Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Leviticus 16, notice what the Bible says in verse 20. In Leviticus 16 and verse 20, I'm going there because this is the entire day. But Leviticus 16, 20 takes us not to the beginning of the day of atonement, when he went into the holy place or most holy place, but it takes us to the end of the day of atonement when he comes out. And it has to take place at the time pointed out in the symbolic service, and we're nearing that time in 2023. We're there, brothers and sisters. We're praying, Lord, please get us ready. Look what the Bible says in verse 20. It says, and when he have made an end to reconciling the Lord, talk to me, somebody, the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the, and Aaron, the high priest, represents Jesus. He shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, not the tail, but the what? Talk to me, somebody, the what? Why the head? Why the head? Because he's now fulfilling that ancient messianic prophecy of the crushing of Satan's head. Does it make sense? Now, it goes on to say, watch it now. It says, and confess over him how much? How much sin is he going to put over him? Talk to me. All their iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgression, and all their three things. All their iniquities, all their transgressions, all their sins. Let's say it together. All their iniquities, all their transgressions, all their sins. One more time. You sound like a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, what is an iniquity? Sin. What is a transgression? That is sin. It's transgression. What is sin? Sin. So he's telling us all of the sin will be gone. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If all of the sin has been given to Jesus before he left the most holy place, if all the sins have been given to Jesus before he comes back the second time, before he comes to the outer court, if all the sin was given him, how much sin would the congregation have left? Talk to me, somebody. They would be less of sin. Am I right? How much sin? So then they would be a sinless congregation. So in the type, in order for Michael, the priest, to win the game, he has to on time produce a sinless generation so that he can leave the most holy place. But the time to do that is about right now. And we're still in sin. Do you see why Satan says, if I can eliminate seven Adventists, no other body even know this. Do you know the Catholic Church? They think that it's already over right now. The Catholic Church and every other evangelical church, they believe that it's already over right now. Only one denomination understands this. Only one. Now look at this right there. Look what it says. Look, look what the book is called. This is a book. What's it called? That's the name of the book. Crushing Satan's Head. You think a seven Adventist wrote this? No. This man wrote it. Friar James Marsley. You know who he is? He's a Catholic priest. He wrote, crushing Satan's head, the Virgin Mary's victory over the Antichrist. They don't understand Genesis 3.15. No, they think that that woman, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, they think that's the Virgin Mary. They do not understand Genesis 3.15. As a result, they believe that it's over. They believe that it's over. Now, brothers and sisters, Christian Satan said, the Virgin Mary victory over the enemy Christ foretold. I wouldn't go and buy it on Amazon. What do you say? God has given us the answer to all of this. Do you know that every institution that God has given Seventh-day Adventists is for the purpose of preparing us for this time? All the publishing houses, all the schools, all the food factories, all this. And Satan says, I've got to eliminate everything that's been given to Seventh-day Adventists. I've got to eliminate everything. Would you put it back up very quickly? Thank you. I've got to eliminate every Seventh-day Adventist. And so he says, I want to eliminate every institution. Let me tell you something right now. Every institution that we have at Seven at Venice has been taken over by the devil himself. Our schools, our medical facilities, everything has been taken over. Our factories. I remember talking to one man, he was delivering for one of our factories. He said, how can Seven at Venice deliver this food and they're killing the nation? The deliverer. He wasn't seven evidence, but he's carrying these products. 
Everything that we have is destroyed. Now, my brothers and sisters, and Satan is trying to prevent the people of God from being prepared. You remember that marvelous statement in uh, First Manuscript, Release 228? It says God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to repair people to do what? Stand true to him during the investigative judgment. That this is why he gave us all of these institutions. That they were to assist us somehow and bring the people of God back to a sinless state. We would understand that the devil says, I've got to wipe them out. I've got to wipe it out of existence because if I can wipe it out, nobody will be prepared. I want to, if, if, if we get this, Heavenly Fathers, we get ready to close. Help us to see, Lord, that it is so important that now more than ever we understand what needs to be done so that we can be brought back to an upright position. That there's a problem, Lord, and we can't finish the work in the condition we're in now. Something has to change, a radical change. But Lord, we can do nothing without you. Please help us, dear God, as we get ready to close in Jesus' name. Amen. I really wanted to show you something on the screen right now, but let's go to John 1 as we get ready to close. Let's go to John, the first chapter. You know, they say sometimes a picture is worth more than what? A thousand words. And this little picture I had was going to sum up a thousand words that I couldn't say. But in John chapter 1, In John chapter 1, we're going to see the solution to it all. We're going to have to unpack it. But we're going to find out that the problem that we have is very simple. Now, did, anyone, did everyone get the handout? Did everyone get the handout that we gave yet last night? Everyone get the handout? If you did not get that handout, it talks about that secret meeting we're talking about. You need to get one. I, I'll probably bring it for the last meeting. I don't have it here with me now. But if you didn't get one, we'll make sure you get one. And at the end, you notice that there are lines at the end. You notice there are lines there? You know those lines before? That you were supposed to go back through it and write down the tactics. Remember the tactics that Satan would use in his plan to try to stop you and I from getting that experience. You know all of it, it says that if I can separate them from Christ. If I can separate, you know, over and over again, he says the same thing. Separate from Christ, separate from the people of God. That's really the method. Anybody care whether really it's worldliness, whether it's an indulgence of appetite, whether it's money, whether it's uh, indulgence of passion, his goal is to separate us from Jesus. That's his plan. Brothers and sisters, the day of atonement is to bring us back together with God so nothing is between our soul and the Savior. We're going to find that the greatest institution that God gave, not the publishing house, not the sanitarium, but the greatest institution God gave is not the school. Not the food factory, the hygienic restaurant. The greatest institution that God has given, the seven that Venice, you know what it is? Talk to me, somebody. It's the home. And Satan knows that if he can destroy the home, the success of the church depends upon the... You know that every institution is to be run just like a home that God set up. And if we don't understand how to run a home, then we can't run anything else that God has set up. And God is trying to teach us now why? Because the restoration of society begins where? In the home. And what is the devil destroying and attacking the most? The home. But do you know that God has a plan? And that in that plan, God can make our home not like hell. No matter what the condition is, God can make our home like heaven on earth. What do you say? But it's not going to be evolutionary. You know that a home like heaven does not evolve. It must be built one brick at a time. There's one statement in the Spirit of Prophecy that says, One brick upon another, and the highest wall is made. One flake upon another, and the deepest snow is laid. That if we take it one step at a time, God can bring us so that no matter what happens in this final crisis, that our home will become a shelter in that time of storm. What do you say? The Bible says in John chapter 1. Are you there? Amen. It says in verse 29. Let's read it together the next day. John see of Jesus coming into him and said. Behold. The Lamb of God. Which taketh away. 
the sin of the world. That's what Satan's trying to stop. But if we look at Jesus, if our family looks at Jesus, if we imitate the lovely Jesus, we're going to show that that's not just theoretical. We're going to see that that means something very specific. We're going to see the solution to all of our problems. I want to follow him. What do you say? By beholding him, guess what? We'll be changed. And with Jesus and the family, happy, happy home. And with Jesus, not knocking at the door of Laodicea, but in the heart, you'll finish the work. I want to be a part of that team. What do you say? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have not covered everything that we needed to study, but Lord, we saw enough tonight to see that we do have a problem. The fact that we're sinning, the fact that we don't know you like we should, the fact that, dear God, that we are not in your plan and in your way right now and is evidence and everything in this world is falling apart. Lord, we need you like never before. Satan's final solution is about to be invoked. And the only way that we can make it through that is to be in God's final solution. And if we are in Christ, not one who is abiding in Christ will fail or fall. Give us Jesus, Lord. I pause the prayer. Someone says, Lord, tonight I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want my family to have him. Just raise your hand wherever you are. You say, Lord, I want to make that decision. Wherever God leads, I want to follow. Father, we're lifting our hands. Keep us. Take us. Lord, may we lead and follow wherever you lead. Let's follow the Lamb. Lord, help us to follow you whithersoever you go. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.